Hi, everybody. Welcome to Coffee with Coffee. Um, glad you could join us today. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in and supporting Coffee. Um, I'm hoping everybody is safe and sound at home in these crazy times. So I've got a lot I want to share with you today, so I'm going to jump right into it here. That's me saying hi again to everybody. Uh, the topic today is going to cover both hydronic and plumbing components. We do have some air vents that I think are uh, unique in the industry right now, specific to plumbing. So we're going to chat a little bit about both of those as we go through here. So let's get going. Most of the um, slides and the information I'm going to talk about today comes out of this issue of hydronics number 15. Now this is about separation, which of course includes air, dirt, magnetic, but there is quite a bit on the air vents in this issue too. Uh, in addition to this, we did issue number, I think 21 and 22 were on plumbing specific products. So we do talk more about the uh, products that we have for plumbing specifically, a little bit about air vents, our plumb vent in there also. So um, we didn't put those on the slide, but know that we do have some plumbing specific hydronics. Hopefully everybody has signed up and receiving hydronics. If you'd like to get this uh, journal that we put out twice a year, typically June and uh, uh, the beginning of the year, usually we have an issue at Asteroid, so we try and do January and June uh, issue on different topics. Um, drop us a line, go to our website, and you can sign up for them there. If you need some back issues, also know that they're on our website as a PDF if you need some, some information that you want to pull out of those hydronics for your own use. So let us know on future topics, too, if there's something you can think about that we could be talking about. Um, we'd love to hear what your uh, your thoughts are for upcoming issues. So, yeah, here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, what is air? How does it affect our system? Different between oxygen and air in a system. Um, issue with the common components when we have air in a system, how we get it out, and, again, a little bit about domestic water. So, uh, again, a lot to talk about today, but we're going to get through all of this. So. All right, let's talk about what air is, first of all. Some of this I just pulled right off of a, a Google search on what is air. So uh, the air we breathe is about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, some other inert gases there, and some uh, dust and other things in there. So uh, important about that when we start talking about hydronics is that um, there's a difference between air and oxygen in the system, different uh, things can happen if we have a lot of oxygen in our system and we're going to go over, you know, a little bit about uh, oxygen ingress into a system too. So of course, we know air is an insulator, so if we've got air in our heat exchangers, if we've got air in our radiators, if we have air in our boilers, obviously we want to do a good job of removing that big air bubbles, small air bubbles, micro air bubbles that all needs to come out of our system so we have a good uh, heat transfer between the um, the fire to the water and the water to the metals and obviously the, the metal to the, uh, to the load in the room. So uh, got to get it out, got to do a good job of that. Air pressure obviously changes as we go up in altitude. Uh, I'm going to show a little graph about why the pressure that we put in the hydronic system is important, both for air removal and also for the uh, the operation of that system. And then uh, why do we even pressurize a hydronic system? We'll talk a little bit about that also. All right, I want to talk a little bit about oxygen. So within that component of air, we have what I said about a 21% percentage of oxygen. So here's what happens when you fill a system uh, with water. Within that water, uh, I think Amtrol did a study on this years ago, they say can, there can be about 4% air in that water. So when we put water into a system, there's going to be some air in there. And we're going to do our best to power purge it out when we first fill a system. And um, our, hopefully our air vents and our micro bubble resorbers are going to get the rest of it out. But now there's also oxygen that went in with that air. And so here's what's going to happen is within a couple of days of putting that system in there with that little bit of oxygen and air that might be left over after you fill it, the oxygen part of that, it's going to corrode anything in the system that is a ferrous metal. It's going to oxidize it. And so what would happen if you took a circulator pump apart maybe two or three days after you installed it, take the four bolts out, take the motor head out of the volute, and you'll see a little bit of red or discoloration on that cast iron volute. And that's an indication that the oxygen that was in the system has oxidized the metals. You'd probably find the same thing inside an expansion tank or a steel nipple that you might have used in there. Now, what happens then is the oxygen that's in that system has been consumed or used up in the process of oxidizing the metals. And we have, if you look at the bottom sentence there, what we call uh, dead water. It's water that's been starved of oxygen. And we know this from uh, the Great Lakes and some of the lakes up in uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, I suppose, where they have these what they call dead zones in the lakes now 
where the algae blooms have consumed all the oxygen out of the water and the fish and the uh, aquatic life can no longer live in those areas. So the same thing, we've got uh, oxygen depletion in the water in the lakes. Uh, we have oxygen starved out of the, um, the hydronic system. So it's really hard to keep oxygen out of the system. Just know that it can get the migrate through the wall, the tubing. In fact, I put a little uh, DIN standard down here is how oxygen can get through the wall of PEX tubing. Now we put barriers on the tubing to slow that oxygen ingress down, but you can't stop it. This uh, gives an example of the rate that they lower it down. And by the way, the hotter you run water through um, a tubing, the higher the uh, potential for oxygen ingress into that tubing and see how it changes here as we raise the temperature of water going into it. So low temperature radiant, not as much issue. When you start doing high temperature jobs with PEX tubing, you can expect to see a little bit more oxygen getting into that. Obviously, it can get around uh, packing seals it can get in. It can get around pump seals. If you've got a three-piece pump, oxygen can get in around that um, seal area also. Up here, just a little uh, a book that I read a couple years ago called Rust. And what the, uh, the author that wrote this book, Jonathan here, he spent a couple weeks at what they call Ken University in Colorado, Ball Manufacturing, who's one, I guess, the largest manufacturer of aluminum cans, they have a little school that you can go to. So if you create a beverage, let's say, and you go to them and say, well, I've created this beverage, I want you to put it in a, a can for me. So they'll analyze your product and they'll see what type of a, a can a coating they have to put inside that can to um, make sure that your product doesn't eat through the aluminum can or that your product doesn't get a taste and stuff like that. So it was a, it was a really good read. They talk about rust and corrosion in general, how it's destroying a lot of our equipment. Uh, they talk about the Alaska pipeline, how the corrosion on that affects it and how they pick that line and stuff. So if you are a reader, and this might be a good time to be reading, if you're stuck at home for a while, uh, grab a copy of that and, and read it. it. Was I thought it was a really good book. So um, yeah, I think I covered all these talking points. Certainly, I'm not an expert. I'm not uh, pretending to be a you know a, a scientist or an engineer when it comes to water quality and stuff like that. I might be punching a little bit above my weight on some of these topics, but uh, I have a pretty good understanding of what it does in our um, hydronic systems. And here's some pictures of exactly what happens when you have uh, a corrosion going on inside a system where you have air bubbles. So let's start over here on the left. And here's a classic example where we had to go up and over the top of this I-beam with a, a section of piping. And obviously that's going to be a spot where we could trap an air bubble in there. So when we first fill and purge the system, we got to make sure we've got a, a method to get this air bubble out of there. Now, it could in fact just be the uh, initial purge that you're doing, that you have enough flow going through there to push this bubble out of the system and back down to where we can uh, purge it out. In some instances, if you have a high point like this, this might be a place that you want to put a little, either a manual vent that you can vent that air pocket out, or you might want to put a, uh, an auto air vent up there that if you do get air rising up there um, occasionally for a period of time when that system's off, uh, we've got an automatic air vent that can, uh, can deal with that and uh, get that out of the system so you don't have a flow problem. And the center picture here is obviously a pretty... Uh, badly corroded uh, pump volute. Uh, I know where this pump came from, and I know this installer down here, Heat Boy. Um, this is an example of what happens when you have a system that's getting a continuous uh, ingress of oxygen going into it. That's probably not going to happen from the very first time you fill the water and shut the system off. So a couple things that have probably happened to this system, it was connected to a non-barrier tubing system. You know, maybe one of the early uh, tubings that we use for heat transfer tubings that didn't have an adequate oxygen barrier or maybe didn't have an oxygen barrier at all on that. Another thing that could cause this condition, if you've got a system that has a small leak and it's taken on fresh water consistently, maybe once a week it takes on a couple gallons of water because you've got a maybe a pinhole leak in a, a zone in a radiant slab that you don't realize is going on. So um, obviously that pump's not going to work very well when most of the um, the passageway has, has been uh, blocked off by that corrosion. So um, we can identify what causes that. We can stop that. We can deal with that. But that's a condition that uh, you want to be aware of. And then over here on the third picture on the upper right, I mean, that's an example of noise. You know, if you've got air going through a valve like this um, isolation valve or if this is a thermostatic radiator valve, as the flow goes through there and you have air, you're going to hear noise um, coming out of that system. And sometimes in the case of a panel radiator like this, it can actually amplify that noise. It's almost like a speaker, like I show in the picture here that, you know, it's one thing for water going through a pipe making noise, but now when you have a big uh, surface area like that, it actually kind of, uh, amplifies that sound. So we need to get all this out of the system. We need to keep this out of the system, and I'm going to show you how to do that. 
All right, let me talk a little bit about pressure in a system. Now, this has to do with the fill pressure that you, the installer, uh, decides on what pressure goes into a system. And I'm going to ask you, um, how do you decide that? How do you know if you put a, a system in, if it needs 10 pounds of pressure, 12 pounds of pressure? Does it need 30 pounds of pressure? So here's what the, uh, re the relationship is. We know it takes about 0.4 through 3 PSI to lift water up a foot. So if I have the next example here, 10 foot column of water, I'm going to have to put 4.33 PSI of pressure on the bottom of that water column to get it to lift up, lift up, lift up until I fill that pipe completely to the top. Now, if I don't put adequate pressure on there, what's going to happen is that I'm going to fill the water to maybe this point right here, at let's say uh, three pounds of pressure, and now I've got a big air bubble in there. Now, a couple things I want to do on a riser like this. Number one, I want to put one of our auto air vents on the top of that. So as I'm filling, 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 filling this with water, I'm squeezing the air out and I can evacuate the air so I don't end up with a uh, air bubble at the top here. So um, <clears throat> in addition to having this 4.33 PSI down here to fill this all the way to the top, what I'd like to have, if I'm going to use one of these automatic air vents, the way this vent works is when the water comes in here, it uh, causes this float to float up. So the air comes out until the water hits the float, rises up and shuts off the little valve here. In addition to just the buoyancy of that float in the water, shutting off that little valve up there, if I add five pounds of pressure, additional five pounds of pressure, now this pressure is going to help me make sure that I get a good tight seal on this little, uh, let's call it a needle valve. That's typically what it is on the top of these air vents. So make sure you've got enough pressure to fill it. So take your 10 feet of elevation, your lift here times 0.433 and maybe add five pounds. So I'd probably want to fill this system to uh, maybe nine pounds, 10 pounds of pressure. That's going to make sure that I've got my air shoved out and also going to make sure that I've got a little positive pressure to help me with my air vent there. So, and then, you know, take that example wherever you want. Sometimes routing this up to 0.5 makes the math easier in your head. So let's say I drive up to a building and I estimate it's 30 feet tall. I'm going to take 30 feet times 0.5, give me 15 PSI. That will give me this little bit of extra pressure on the top. So now I've got my fill and I've got my little bit of a extra uh, buffer that we call that five pounds at the top of the system. So obviously a gauge on the system somewhere, an accurate gauge, so you know what that reading is, so you're sure that you get your system filled up. So you get to decide what this pressure is going to be on the building that you're working on, the building that you're troubleshooting, the building that you're designing. Um, you need to know what the lift is from the point where your equipment is to the highest point in that building, and that's where you come up with the uh, the fill pressure number. Know, too, that when you buy an expansion tank, <clears throat> before you put it into a system, you want to check the pressure that's on that little tire stem on the end of it. And you're going to need to adjust that pressure to whatever fill pressure that you're going to put into this building. That expansion tank needs to be set at that pressure also so that the bladder, the bag inside that expansion tank has enough uh, acceptance room as you start uh, heating up the water. It starts expanding. So that's just a little... Um, kind of information on what the fill pressure has to do. And of course, it has a lot to do with air removal. Uh, if you don't have adequate fill pressure, you can have an air problem from day one, and that system can have an air problem from the for the rest of its life. A little tip also, if you have a problem, uh, problematic job with air, sometimes just increasing this fill pressure down here a pound or two, what it's going to do is if you do have a little air space or an air bubble trapped in there, if I put another two pounds of pressure on that, I'm going to squeeze this right out of the system, either out my air vent or squeeze it small enough that it can come back to my central air purger. So know that if you've got a uh, chronic air problem, sometimes just increasing the, uh, the fill pressure is a good way to get rid of that. All right, to make a long story long, we are going to uh, talk about all these different type of air vents. Um, if you get a chance to look through the Clefty catalog, you can see there's quite a few different choices of air vents. This is a manual air vent here where you could put a little hose, put a little cup or something on that, and just open this thumb screw. We've had those available. Uh, we have different sizes and different styles of these type of uh, auto vents, we call them here, little float type of vents, a little robocal. We've got a couple other uh, sizes. We go from eighth inch uh, up to three quarter on this big uh, size over here. We've got some accessories down here. This is a little hydroscopic vent. I want to talk about that next. We've got repair parts for our vents. If you do have a uh, one that's been damaged up on the top and the seal or something like that, you can just uh, simply take the top off of this and rebuild or replace that. I'm going to talk about these uh, special little accessories that we have here. This is what's called an anti-siphon cap that we have available. And I'm going to go into each one of those products and see if there's something that might um, 
help you in your jobs and stuff. So I thought first interesting would be to show you a little exploded view of what these little air vents look like inside. And depending on the model number, they're going to be a little different build inside here. But this is really the secret to any of them is you've got a float that floats up and it's going to activate this little, think of this as a, uh, not a, like a Schrader valve or a tire stem that you might have on your uh, on your car or your vehicle. That's really what's going on here is this float pushes that little Schrader valve against that little O-ring and that's the seal. That's where you want to look if you've got a vent that's dripping or spitting or dribbling or spraying worst case scenario probably is something is stuck right in between here it could be teflon tape it could be solder um, balls of solder that got into the system somehow um, all of our air vents can be as disassembled right here on this fine thread first time you might need a channel locks after that you can actually disassemble reassemble this by hand and you'll get a seal because this o-ring right here on the cap is making the seal it's not the threads that are sealing this, so you don't have to put a wrench on that and really crank it down. One other tip I want to give you about this vent right here, you can see in the picture the blue obvious is water. So what's going to happen is the fluid comes in, it's going to push the air bubble out, push the air bubble out, until the water gets up to about this level right here. Notice that there's a little bit of airspace, this white layer up here is airspace, and this valve is shut off, I don't know if you can see that close enough right now, but there's a little bit of air gap in here. Now, I've been tempted to do this myself. I'll take that cap off and I'll reach in there with my thumbnail or screwdriver and push that little stem in till I get air coming out. And then I know that I've got all the air out of my system. You really don't want to do that. We like to have this little head space or this little air gap in there so that as we fill this up, if there is any debris in here, like you know Teflon tape or something that might be floating up with the water, if I push that stem in, immediately I'm going to pull those shards of Teflon tape or whatever might be in there right up into my valve seal. And from the minute you put this vent in, it's going to start dripping or leaking out of there. So don't be tempted to burp them out up here. If you do want to burp this vent out to make sure you've got water up to this point, maybe just loosen it a little bit down here until you see water trickling out, tighten it back, and then uh, leave this little air gap, this little air space in there because it is in there to protect that, um, that seal that's being made in there. High capacity over here, everything just gets a little bit bigger, basically, bigger thread size, a bigger uh, valve mechanism, so we have a little higher flow rate um, going through that vent. We do make different connection sizes and different connection types. Uh, we got threaded, we've got sweat, we've got um, press on most of our, our components right now. This is kind of a unique one over here. This uh, can be used as a vertical or horizontal vent. Those are really nice for putting under uh, Modcon boilers, if you want to put it on the vertical piping coming out of the boiler, uh, you can just rotate the collar on that and make it work for either horizontal or vertical application. So, so let's talk a little bit about what we can do to this product right here. So <clears throat> this is an example of a, let me move my little toolbar out of my screen here a little bit. Sorry about that. Um, an example of a when I just went out my shop and, and took it apart. So this is where you can disassemble that vent and uh, get in there to clean it or service it or replace or rebuild this little cap right here. Uh, this is a little service valve. We offer that on some of our vents right out of the um, out of the catalog. You can buy it with the, with the service check or you can buy this as a, a separate uh, optional item from eighth inch to half inch. And so here, taking this cap, and I don't know how clear this is on your screen there, I tried to zoom in close. Right there is where that little seal is being made. You can see the little black O-ring in here, and you can see that little tapered um, pin or plunger right here, I guess you would call it. That's what's making the seal. If you take this cap off, you can sometimes just squirt that a little bit with some water or maybe just reach in there and pull something out that might be causing that uh, cap to leak. Occasionally this O-ring can fail, or if somebody gets in there with a pocket knife or a screwdriver trying to dig something out of there that's stuck in there, you can rip the O-ring. Obviously then um, you're gonna need to be able to uh, replace that cap. That's not something you can do. But just knowing that you can get this cap off and services in the field could maybe uh, save a callback where you don't have a new vent with you. You don't wanna leave the vent disconnected or pulled out of there. Um, just uh, if you have a service check, that makes it real easy, but um, you can get in there to um, uh, do some work on that vent and clean it out. This is a clever little uh, vent that we make. This is what's called a hydroscopic. And what this is, this little vent here is both a manual and an automatic air vent. Chrome plated because these are typically used in an exposed application, maybe on a towel bar, uh, maybe on a cast iron radiator in somebody's living room or something like that. So we plate them. 
And so the way this vent works is if you open it in one direction, it just allows the uh, air and the water to come out here. So again, put a sponge or a bucket or something under this, open it up and it's a manual air vent. So if you're filling up your radiator, in this case over here, if you wanna purge out this uh, thin tube loop that this uh, installer's put the hydroscopic on, you can first just burp it out like that. And then when you screw it into the other position, what happens is there's a bunch of cellulose fiber discs in here. You can see kind of a stack of maybe six or eight of these discs. And when the discs are dry, they're thin and it allows the air to come out through there. And so as the air comes out, the air comes out, finally you get water up to that point. As soon as the water hits these little discs in there, they swell up and they shut this flow off. So it's a vent that works without any um, mechanism there, like a needle or seed or anything like that. It's just dependent on the these cellulose fiber washers in there. This is uh, uh, just swelling up kind of like the sponges you used to get in the mailbox years ago. They look like a piece of cardboard when you open the envelope, you put them in water and they immediately pop up. That's really what's going on in here. This little um, device right here is what we call a ball check. If you had to replace this someday, maybe somebody hits that uh, and breaks that off or something like that and you have to replace the cap, if you unscrew it from this connection right here, if you can see the little threads right there, it will shut that off and you can take this part out and put a new one in without losing any water, without having to lower the pressure, without getting squirted in the face, trying to do a flying hot connection on it, you can replace this. Know that we do recommend every uh, maybe three to five years, you might need to replace this. There is a life expectancy on these are just natural fiber, to be honest with you, and they do have a life expectancy. I think that would be based on the type of fluid they're in, number one, how many times they have to get dry and wet, dry and wet, swell up and uh, shrink down to allow the water and uh, air to come through that. So um, just know that keep an eye on these if you put them in an application like this, that someday you don't get a call and the Berber carpet here is all wet because the fiber discs have uh, uh, deteriorated on that and that's again why we give you that that little service check in there that you can quickly switch that out uh, and thanks to uh, Jason there for sending this picture along on this uh, where he switched out the little manual air vent on that and put one of the hydroscopic vents in there hopefully you didn't do this right here Jason <laughs> So here's a, a couple of the different accessories I'm going to show you. These are different uh, vents. Here's an example of a vent that you can order with a hydroscopic cap. And what this hydroscopic cap is, is we just load a bunch of those fiber washers on the top of this cap to do what I just explained on that previous slide, that if we have air coming out of this and water comes out of this and it hits those discs in there, it's going to swell up and just shut off that little opening. So essentially what you're doing with this cap right here is you're getting a second shutoff mechanism. We're dependent on the float and the little needle valve in there to be our primary and then, you know, should be our shutoff mechanism most of the time. If something happened there, again, you got Teflon tape or something stuck in there, and this vent had a little bit of a dribble or a little bit of a seep coming out of it, this cap isn't intended to catch that and give you a second level of protection. So that's a good um, application to put this cap on your vents if you're going to put it into a uh, maybe a above a ceiling where you've got a drop ceiling and you're worried about uh, water coming through the ceiling someday if this vent were to fail that gives you an extra sec secondary uh, shutoff mechanism you can add this to most of our air vents we'll accept this cap some of our our tiny little robocalls have a different thread but most of the vents um, allow you to take off either the black cap or the um, the brass cap that comes on them and add that cap on to it. Same thing here, know that if these are being used a lot, you're gonna to have to replace this cap um, at some point. Again, this is a second safety cap. You shouldn't depend on this to make your seal on this air vent. We want this air vent to be shutting off with its valve mechanism in here. This is just, again, a little uh, condom, if you will, to put on your air vent. Over here, this little device right here is what's called an anti-siphon cap. And basically what it is, it's a check valve. It allows air to come out, but air can't go back this direction through this cap here. So if you take your cap off your air vent and you screw one of these on there, now this air vent can allow discharge, but it can't allow air to get sucked in there. And you say, well, why would air go into an air vent? I thought it allows air out of a system. Well, in fact, I'm gonna show you how you can get to a condition where an air vent like this can allow, actually allow air to go into it. So it becomes an air uh, admittance device instead of an air elimination device. Um, this is a cap that, you know, you're kind of treating the symptom. If you have that problem, you got to figure out why you have a subatmospheric or negative pressure condition that's allowing air to go in there, but it's a quick fix until you can come back and uh, maybe change some piping and solve the problem that you're, you're having that condition exist in the first place. 
Over on the right here, an example of two of our different service checks. There's an eighth inch version there. There's a half inch version there. I think you can see pretty much what this does. When I screw this in there, it's going to push this valve open down here. And then when I screw this out, this little check valve just pops up and uh, allows you to take the vent off and repair it or service it. And so here's the whole assembly. There's your service check valve, there's your anti-siphon cap, and there's your hydroscopic cap. So now instead of just having an automatic flow type of vent, I've actually got a four-in-one device here in the fact that I've got a serviceability, I've got my air vent in here, I've got my anti-siphon, and I have my hydroscopic cap all built onto one assembly. Like I say, you can buy this vent with this already included. You can buy it with this cap included. The anti-siphon cap is a separate component. It's in our catalog. Um, you can buy that. You can add it to, you know, most of the air vents out there, to be honest with you, are using the same metric thread. It's pretty good chance it's going to fit on other brands. If you're using a different brand that you want to solve a problem uh, like that, there's a good chance that our little uh, uh, anti-siphon cap or our hydroscopic cap will fit on a, another brand. Uh, what else there? I think I covered all that. Another accessory that we have, being that these are a metric thread on here, there might be a, a point that you want to put a discharge tube on an air vent, whether it's an automatic air vent or in this case, it's actually out in my shop. Sorry, it's a little dirty, but it's been it's been working for about five years. This basically turns that metric thread there into a quarter inch uh, NPT thread. So now you can get whatever adapter you want. If you want to go to a copper adapter, if you want to put a uh, maybe a rubber tube or something like that on, and have this discharge go down to the floor, it's just a thread converter basically. You can probably find them on McMaster Car also, but we do have those. Uh, in our catalog to uh, convert that thread. Now here's a, that's another boiler out in my shop. This is a little lock and bar night boiler that I have. It had a little quarter inch air vent in here and it started to dribble one day. So uh, I said, you know what, I'm gonna replace that vent. And in the process of doing that, I did a couple things. Here's number one, I increased the size a little bit. That was a quarter inch size there. So I put a, a little reducing coupling here, a stainless steel nipple. So there's my service check. So now I've got a check in there. So if I do have to get into this again down the road at some point, I've got the ability to just unscrew it at this point here, take it apart and service it. I don't know if you can notice on the top, but I did put an anti-siphon and a hydroscopic cap. So I've got that extra protection because I don't want this leaking down inside the case here, uh, leaking down on my wires, leaking down on the uh, components below that. And why I want to have a vent inside um, the boiler like this, or sometimes this will be on the piping right external to the boiler up there. I think I got a picture of that coming up. And so here's what's going to happen inside this little boiler heat exchange. Every time the burner comes on inside this boiler, this is the condition that's going to be going on in here. I should have moved that down a little bit. <clears throat> Whenever I put fire against water, so there's my flame. Maybe I've got a wall temperature of 320 degrees, just some arbitrary numbers there. And I'm heating the stainless steel metal. That's my heat exchanger coil that's inside this boiler, what's gonna happen is, and you can try this at home tonight, take a saucepan out of your cupboard, put some water in it, put it on the stove, turn the burner down, and almost immediately, if you watch that water, you're gonna see little bubbles start forming on the bottom of that pan, and they're gonna rise up out of the pan. Well, that's what's going on inside a boiler every time that burner kicks on, is these little bubbles are gonna be um, coming off that hot metal surface as I heat that water, it's gonna displace those bubbles. Now, ideally, I wanna get those bubbles out, I wanna have a device, a micro bubble type of device, which we'll talk about also at the end here, to eliminate these bubbles. And if I don't get these little micro bubbles out, what's gonna happen is when this burner goes off and the temperature in the system drops down to whatever, let's say ambient room temperature at some point, these little bubbles that you've just driven out of solution by heating this water are gonna go back in the solution in the water and you're gonna do this over and over and over again every time you heat it up. This little device is in there, so when you fill this, the boil, this boiler up, you're gonna get most of that air out. It's also gonna help get these out as you start um, heating that water every time you wanna get any air bubbles that can make their way up to this high point um, out of the system. So, But I really wanna do a little bit better job with this type of bubble right here, these micro bubbles. When I say micro bubble, uh, an example of that, uh, if you go to your kitchen faucet tonight, you fill up a glass with water from your kitchen faucet, you're going to notice that it's going to be cloudy at the top when you first fill it. And what's happening in there is as soon as you've taken the pressure off that water, these little micro bubbles are going to rise to the surface of that glass. And within probably 10 or 15 minutes, you're going to have a perfectly clear glass of water as these micro bubbles come out of solution, rise to the top, they go out. <clears throat> 
And what they're going to look like is just cloudy water. You don't even realize that that's actually a little air bubble in there. You think, oh, it's just cloudy from coming through the, uh, maybe through the aerator on the faucet or, you know, coming out of your well pump or wherever your water is coming from. But in fact, you've got micro bubbles out of there and they're going to come out of solution for one of two reasons. And I'm going to explain that here in a second. But here's a picture that was sent to us uh, a couple years ago from an installer up in Canada, a couple IBC boilers. And hopefully you can see in the picture here, a lot of the boilers, when they send them out, they're going to send an air vent with it and say, listen, if you're coming out of the top of this boiler, there's a the supply coming out of the top of this boiler, they want you to put a T up there and put that air vent at the highest point on that boiler. So as we fill, fill, fill this boiler, the air is going to come out of that air vent. Well, that's a kind of a tricky place to put an air vent, knowing that if that vent would ever fail, it's going to run right down inside the cabinet of this boiler. So what this installer here has done is use our little conversion our thread adapter conversion, and you can see he's taken, he's formed it nicely to a piece of copper tube, and he's brought it right down to the floor here. So if that vent does leak or discharge someday, it's going to be down here instead of inside the boiler. So on every one of these boilers, you can see he's got a, a little discharge tube. In fact, even on our big um, three-quarter inch vent on this big hydro separator, I don't know if you can see it there, but there's also a little a vent tube that comes off of the top of that and goes to the floor, so you don't make a mess of the insulation of that vent. Uh, were ever to leak or to fail. So that's another option. We do have um, some solar rated components still in our catalog. We're kind of um, cutting back a little on some of our solar thermal offering, but these are pretty popular. These are high temperature. I don't know if you can read right on the side of them. There's a 300 degree um, operating temperature air vent here, 150 PSI. I'll talk about the pressure here in a minute. Um, we make uh, these out of a little different components inside here. The materials that we use for both the um, the seal at the top, as well as the float that's inside there, is made out of a high temperature plastic. So we can use those in applications where you might see um, this type of temperature. Where you'd see that on a solar collector is a stagnation condition. If the circulator pump shuts off and the collector's up on the roof, you can easily get over 300 degrees on a, on a sunny day in a collector. So um, this vent gets used up on the top of the collector. And also, um, here's a central air purger that would go back in the, in the mechanical room down by the uh, heat exchange or something like that. It's also rated at 320 degrees. So if you have applications where you need high temperature, solar, whatever it might be, know that we've got these available in uh, a couple different versions. There's an MPT, there's a, a, a female thread on this one and a, a three quarter version of a, an air a purger instead of an air vent. All right, one of the most important things, I do this in every single class that I present on air removal, is uh, this is a Nobel and Gossa drawing from back in the 1960s that uh, actually I think John Siegenthaler kind of put it in color for us and made it a little bit more understandable than the old black and white version of it. So here's what happens when we have a closed loop piping system. So I made a closed loop piping system and I put a pressure gauge on every corner of this loop, the circuit, let's call it, we went around there. And I'm gonna fill this thing up to, let's call it five pounds static pressure. I got a low pressure system here. I've got five pounds of pressure. Now, a couple things I need to do on this loop since I wanna circulate water through that, I'm gonna put a circulator pump in there and I'm gonna size that for the, you know, the flow resistance of the circuit. I might have some fin tube in here. It might have radiators, whatever. Let's just keep it simple and just call this a piping loop going around here. Knowing that I'm going to heat this water, or maybe chill this water in a chilled water condition, the pressure in there is going to change. So one of the things that I want to put on this closed circuit is I want to put a, um, oh, let's see, I'm kind of adjectively challenged today. It's unlike me. And it's a shock absorber, a spring, let's call this. That's basically all this expansion tank is, is I've got a diaphragm in this tank that I've got air in here and I've got water in here. And so as this um, system heats up, this is going to be the vessel that accommodates that expansion so I don't pop my fittings apart or I don't pop a safety relief valve that might be a boiler component that would be in this picture if it were in fact a heating system. The relationship of this expansion tank connection, this here is called the point of no pressure change. Wherever you install this expansion tank into a system, this connection, not the physical tank, I could put the tank up here, and if I took a tube and made that connection down here, the point of no pressure change is where I install this into that loop. What we know about water is we can't stretch water like taffy, we can't compress water, not under the pressures that you and I typically work with. So. This pressure here really can't be changed by the, what the circulator pump does. So when this circulator pump kicks on, it's gonna say, okay, I've gotta make a pressure differential. That's the only thing I was designed to do in life is change the pressure from the discharge side to the suction side. 
if I have the point of no pressure change here and this circulator starts and it says it can add maybe eight pounds of pressure differential, it says, well, I can't change that pressure right there. I'm going to make my pressure differential from the suction side of my circulator. So that five pounds of pressure I had in there, now I've pulled it down to a negative, a sub-atmospheric condition. Now, if I move that expansion tank to here, where it should be, this uh, pressure differential that this circulator can uh, develop or create would show up as a positive pressure all the way around the loop. But for the sake of this discussion, I want to show you what happens if somebody were to put one of those automatic air vents right there, and I put that air vent under this condition, or this condition, or this condition, now my automatic air vent becomes an automatic air uh, entrance system into the system. So what's going to happen is when the circulator starts up, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to pull a sub-atmospheric condition, I'm going to pull that float down in that vent, and I'm going to get a little sip of air. Now, maybe you've got an air separator here that's going to grab some of that as that goes on, but over the course of time, I'm sipping air, I'm sipping air, I'm sipping air every time I fire this thing up, and now I've got an air problem. And I go back there, and I purge, and I purge my brains out. Maybe I get rid of the air problem when I'm there. Two weeks later, you get the same call. I've got air back in it. What are you doing? you got to come back. you got to do it again. It's not the air vent. It's this condition that you're putting that air vent under that's allowing that to happen. If I pull a negative pressure, a subatmospheric condition inside that system, I can allow air into that system. The fix for this, obviously, move the expansion tank would be the smartest thing, and immediately I have a positive pressure going around the system instead of a negative pressure. So uh, chronic air problems are sometimes caused by this uh, relationship of the circulator pump and the expansion tank. Um, an air vent here that was causing that problem, you could put that anti-siphon cap on and the problem would go away. Now you're treating the symptom, not the problem. Here's your problem, Vern. The symptom is being treated by the cap. So um, know that we've got a cap that can quickly fix that. Suppose this is in a big commercial building where you can't drop the building down and make this correction until you can turn the heat off for a period of time or drain the building down to be able to do that. You might just put this cap on until you can come back at a later date and uh, make the correction here. Got it? All right, how am I doing for time? All right, I want to talk about another concept, another thing that can happen in, in a system where you've got a circulator pump, and it comes, um, cavitation is what it's called. Um, probably some of you have experienced this or maybe heard about this. You walk up to a circulator pump that's running, and it sounds like it's got gravel. It sounds more like a garbage disposal than a circulator pump. There's a condition that can happen inside there called cavitation. And I like to explain this, and maybe this is right or not, but uh, Cavitation coming from the root word cavity, and what is a cavity? Well, a cavity could be a hole in your tooth, number one. So cavitation is a hole in water. And what can happen under the certain conditions is if I, if I pull a negative pressure condition right at the eye of this impeller right here, I can actually cause these vapor pockets. They're not really an air bubble. They're actually a, a they're hole in water. They're, they're a cavity in water, if you will. And what happens is when you form these little bubbles at the eye of this impeller and they get out into the impeller, they sound like you've got an air problem. And what happens when these little bubbles, these little vapor pockets, I guess, not a bubble really, a vapor pocket collapses, like in this last drawing right here, they form a really powerful jet right here, really destructive force, almost like a miniature uh, sandblaster, if you will. And this is an example of a bronze impeller that was cavitating. And you can see, maybe you can see, how it's actually chewing away the, the, this destructive force of this high pressure jet. Thousands of PSI can be generated at this point when this vapor pocket collapses causes this uh, condition right here where it can actually chew away the metal. It can destroy an impeller in a short period of time. So <clears throat> it often gets misdiagnosed as an air problem and a, a service tech comes on to this job and he hears this condition going on. He thinks, oh, I just got some air in the body of that pump and he purges and purges and purges and maybe gets it to go away. A couple things that's gonna happen is he purges and purges and purges. He's bringing cold water in the system. You're bringing this out of this high temperature condition that might be part of the relationship of why you're causing cavitation in the first place. He thinks he solved an air problem and it keeps coming back. You got a problem, you don't have enough positive suction head on the side of this pump, your static fill pressure is wrong, you got your expansion tech over here and you're pulling this condition and you're causing this cavitation. I rarely see these on these little benign little um, low head circulator pumps. You're gonna more often see this on a big commercial high head circulator, maybe a you know high head 2699 type of circulator, but uh, 
you know, just troubleshoot it far enough that you know you're solving the problem, that it's not the uh, air problem, that it could in fact be a cavitation problem. That word gets used in other applications. Outboard motors can cavitate. You know, that little plate above the prop is called an anti-cavitation plate to keep the prop from getting in that condition. And of course, the, uh, the boat stops moving when the motor starts uh, cavitating. Here's another uh, thing that can happen. I applaud the manufacturer of circulator pumps for giving us the ability to put a check valve in the pump right now. These are called internal flow checks, IFC. What can happen, especially if you put a, a pump in a vertical application like this, if you have air bubbles that you're not um, getting completely out of the system, you don't have a good micro bubble purger on there, and these little micro bubbles are gonna form into bigger bubbles, over a period of time, if this circulator isn't called to run for a while, what can happen is that air can rise up in there and it's gonna get trapped against this little check valve right there. And now what's gonna happen when this pump goes to start next fall or whenever you might need this pump to start again, these little air bubbles are gonna be trapped in the blue of your pump and you're not gonna get flow going through this system because now you've got an air lock in your pump and it's being caused by the relationship of this check being so close to that, um, in the blue to that pump being so close to the, uh, the impeller to the, uh, the discharge side of that circulator. In a perfect world, and I know we don't live in that, uh, I would like to see a check valve about eight pipe diameters downstream of a circulator pump. So you've got, number one, a little bit of space in there for any air bubble that might get in there, but also you're not putting this check in a turbulent condition right there at the discharge side of this uh, this loot. You're going to have a pretty turbulent flow in there, and it can sometimes cause check valves to rattle. Now, these little check valves that come in there are going to be a plastic check, soft seat. They usually have a, a, a rubber in there that the um, the actual mechanism in the seat seats again so you don't get that chattering like you do with a, a brass check valve where you've got um, a condition like this in there but uh, just know that this can happen if it does I would probably take this check valve out and uh, move it up here I would certainly put a good air purger in there so I don't have uh, this potential to have these little air bubbles uh, trapping inside my pump and causing uh, causing problems um, yeah okay how am I looking for time looking pretty good all right, now I'm going to talk a little bit about air removal and air purgers. So air vents are the critical component on an air purger, but an air purger does a little different job than an air vent in the system. And this type of device, uh, different names out there, sometimes they're called air scoops, sometimes they're called ramp purgers, sometimes they're called camel humps by the shape of them. Ramp purger, because this is a ramp in here, and this ramp that's built into this device right here is to encourage flow coming into this for the air to rise up and go out the vent here at the top and the fluid to go down to the bottom. So you know what? I think their time has come and gone. I call it horse and buggy technology. They just don't do a good job of getting these little micro bubbles that are going through our systems on a regular basis out of the system. There's really no mechanism in here. The way this works is we put a wide spot in the road. And whenever, whenever we put a wide um, spot in the road in a piping circuit, if fluid's coming in here at, let's say, four feet per second velocity, let's call that a one-inch pipe, and all of a sudden it sees a chamber that might be, uh, I don't know, called three-inch diameter, we're going to get a drop in velocity as that fluid comes in there. That drop in velocity is going to allow the bubbles to... Um, the fluid to slow down enough that the bubbles can rise up and get to that vent. Some of them will have little veins like this in there trying to encourage the bubbles that are coming in there to go to the top. Some of them will have a ramp in there. There's different ways they build this type of air purger, but it's really dependent on slowing that flow going through there to do most of the work to get the bubbles out of there. A couple of things to know about this type of device. You really don't want to flow this much over four feet per second because what's going to happen is this even this big air is just gonna blow right through the bottom of that. There's not enough um, technology or enough space in this device right here to slow that fluid down to allow those bubbles to come out. So you gotta run them within that two to feet four per second uh, flow range. Don't put an elbow or a fitting right against this. You wanna have at least 18 to 24 inches of straight pipe coming in this, into this device. And that kind of limits where you can put these, of course, in some conditions you don't have a place to get 14 or 18 inches of a uh, straight piping. And the straight piping is just to allow some of these bubbles to start migrating up to the top before it even gets into the device. So, um, you know what? They worked back in the day when we had cast iron boilers that had the air vents built into the boilers. We had uh, boilers that could handle a little bit of air trapped in the sections without burning through them. That's not going to be the case with the new high efficiency boilers. I need this out of the boiler, and I also need this out of the boiler to make sure that I've got a good heat transfer. So um, I would encourage you to look at a little bit uh, a better device for high efficiency air removal, and I'll show you basically how and why we do that. So. 
Here's a classic example of a not so untypical um, hydronic system. I've got a boiler, let's call it a um, <coughs> cast iron boiler. I've got a, uh, some fin tube on here and notice this little graph over here. So this graph shows the relationship between temperature and pressure on a fluid in a system, let's call it water. And if you look at the graph, you'll see the lowest solubility of um, air and water is gonna be at the hottest point in the system. So if I had the system over here, let's just put some numbers to this little schematic right here. Let's say, okay, my boilers run at 170 degrees. Uh, I got 20 pounds of fill pressure in this, 19.8, because I got a little droop between my expansion tank and my, uh, my gauge there. Um, my temperature, obviously, as I go around the circuit's gonna drop. You know, as I go through my fin tube, I'm losing some heat. Going through the fin tube here, I'm losing some heat. But I'm also gonna use up some of the delta P that's being added by the circulator pump going around the circuit. But what I want to do is I want to grab my air at the best place in the system, and the best place in the system is going to be at the hottest point in the system. So I always, always want to put my air vent as close to the discharge side of a, a boiler as I can. Within a, you know inches or feet of a boiler is going to be my first best shot at grabbing that air. That's where my central air purge is going to go. That's where my micro bubble purge is going to go. Now, if I look at this drawing, you say, well, I've got some high points that I created in this system as I went around here. Maybe that's that little elbow I just showed you on a previous slide on the end of a thin tube. That's a good place to either have a manual air vent or an automatic air vent for two reasons. Number one, it's the highest point in the system, but also it's going to be the lowest pressure point in my system because of the elevation difference between this point and this point up here. So looking back over at this graph, there's my best point. There's my second best place to get air out of solution is going to be at the lowest pressure point. So these two work in conjunction with one another. This is really called an air purger, even though it has an air vent built into it. It's really an air purger. This is an air vent. Um, this is going to do work either automatically or manually. If you put a coin screw or that little plastic cap on, you could put one of our hydroscopic vents in there. But you really should put both these in a system. You might have a big... Um, complicated piping system where you have a bunch of risers in a building, that would be a good place to put a uh, what we call a high point air vent because it's going to be your, your lowest pressure point. So think about using them in conjunction with one another. All right, game changer. I put that on the slide because this is what happened. It's probably one of the biggest advancements in air removal and hydronic systems in my lifetime anyways, and maybe the whole industry. So um, what we've done up until recently is just use a, a typical air purger like we talked about. What this does is it takes that concept of, uh, well, let me just point at some things here, that concept of having a low velocity zone here, having a big wide open chamber that as the fluid comes in here, it slows down when it sees that big wide spot in the road, let's call it. Somebody came up with the idea and what a brilliant idea it was and said, you know what? What if we just put something in there, some kind of media, some kind of mesh or screen or something, and what's going to happen is when the flow right over here on the left comes in there, those little veins or fingers or screen or mesh, whatever it might be, different brands use different types of uh, media, we call it inside there. Now when these little bubbles and these little tiny little micro bubbles are coming in there, they get stuck on all these different veins in there. And now as you can see in the picture, the little bubbles are going to turn into bigger bubbles and bigger bubbles and they'll float up to the top and now we can evacuate it. We can get it out of the top of this air vent. So it was that simple, ladies and gentlemen. All we had to do is put something in the way there. Call it a coalescing media officially. I call it a collision media because that's exactly what's happening here is all this air is colliding. The air that's in the water stream is colliding into this um, mesh that's in there as it goes through there. And that's what's uh, doing a 90% plus efficiency um, and evacuating both the big air bubbles and the small air bubbles. So we did kind of soup this thing up as we build it over the years. And what we did um, in here is what we understood is if you put a device like this in the system and you put a level on it, you get perfectly level in both directions, plumb level. And um, you go and let's say you crimp it with a crimp tool and it twists a little bit, goes off a level. What can happen in here, I don't know how well you can see it on your picture there, but this float is really close to the wall of this brass cylinder going up here. And if it goes off a level, let's say at a little bit of an angle like this, what can happen is that float can hang up or rub on the side of this uh, brass chamber in here, and either it won't go up when it's supposed to, it won't go down when it's supposed to, and from day one, uh, the air purger is not doing what it's supposed to for you. Because at the end of the day, this is called an air purger. It's the air vent that's really doing the, the work here, the heavy lifting of getting the air out of the system. This is grabbing it, but this is the device that needs to eliminate it. So this has to work. And so what we did here is we've taken and put a brass pin inside this uh, air purger, and we are air separator, we call it. 
And then we put a hole in the float here. So this float actually rides up and down on the pin and that keeps it perfectly centered in here. I could actually put this vent at, you know, 22, 45 degree angle like this, and this float will still uh, be able to ride up and down smoothly because the pin is what's keeping it centered in there. And then of course up here is where we have the uh, shutoff mechanism. The float goes up, moves that little stainless steel linkage here, closes off that valve. So what we want to do when we start making bigger sizes from two inch pipe uh, size and up, we make a welded steel vessel. It's just getting to be a little bit too much brass to make a vessel that big. So this is a welded steel vessel. It'll have an ANSI flange connection on it instead of a uh, threaded connection. And a couple of things that we did unique on this one is this little um, fitting, I guess I'll call it right here. I call it a gooseneck. And basically what it does is we've taken, we put in a uh, half inch ball valve with a garden hose connection on it here. And so what you're gonna do is when you're filling up your boiler, your system for the very first time, could be a chiller, um, as a fluid, the water starts rising up, rising up, rising up in here. If you put a hose on this, maybe a garden hose or a wash machine hose down to a drain or into a bucket so you can see what comes out of it, if we open that valve, it's gonna allow us to skim any particles that might be floating in that water as we're filling up. There might be sawdust in there, there might be Teflon tape in there. Anything that's in that uh, piping system when it was assembled is gonna end up wanting to come out of this thing here. So by grabbing it here, we're gonna grab it before it can get up and do uh, harm up inside my little valve stem here. So it becomes a fast fill port. It's gonna allow me to fill a system much quicker because I'm evacuating my air with a half inch ball valve instead of a little eighth inch opening up here. So I can fill up quicker. I can skim my, uh, my fluid as it fills up, get any debris out of it. And also it gives me a port right here. Let's say I wanted to inject some chemical in the system. Maybe I want to put a cleaner in there and run it for a day, or maybe I want to put an oxygen scavenger or some kind of chemical in there. All I have to do is connect onto that and have a little pressure pump or some of these, uh, the new cleaners and conditioners actually come in an aerosol can with a garden hose connection on it. Screw it right onto that connection, pull the trigger, and now you've, uh, you've got a port that you can inject some uh, cleaner chemical into your system. So it becomes a device that does the air elimination. It does the, you know, the purging, the fast purge for you. Um, it's rebuildable. The tops come off of these. So if you had problems up in here with that little uh, valve getting plugged up or getting uh, compromised from uh, something getting in there, you can just unscrew on both of these. So what we started doing our bigger vessels here is we, we've taken this uh, high performance little brass separator and we've taken the top portion of it off here. And now we put the top portion into our welded steel vessel. So now that gives you an entry port into this chamber. If something was stuck in there, maybe a glove or a rag or something like that, you can right here, doesn't take much to get this apart. It's uh, put together with a fine thread and an O-ring. You can take this top right off and now you've got uh, access inside the, uh, the welded steel cylinder. On this one here, we're gonna use a composite media in that. And we do that so if you do have aggressive water conditions, uh, it won't affect that if you have low pH or something like that. On the welded steel vessels, obviously we can't use a composite in there because we have to weld this. We have to weld the heads. We have to weld the uh, seam on that and also the nipples. So this will be a stainless steel uh, meteor mesh inside there. So it, it's certainly um, up to the task of the temperature and anything that you might put in it, but it is a little bit different uh, than the, the polymer that we use in the brass type events where we can uh, put that in as we assemble it. <clears throat> Um, oh yeah, one last thing. So on the media, by making it out of a composite on these smaller ones here, what we can do is we can put a shape on that. And if you look at one of these closely, you'll see it's kind of a faceted shape, almost like the, uh, oh, like the, the Delta uh, fighter wings, you know, how they've got those faceted wings on some of the fighter planes and bomber planes these days. And by doing that, the more edges you can put on this material when you build it, when you shape it, the more potential to grab this air going there. So it's not just the very leading edge of it. We actually have edges all around this. And it also has a little bit of a, an arc to it. So as the water comes in there, you'll get a little bit of movement trying to encourage that, uh, that debris to um, uh, to cling onto the surface as it goes through there. So we think it's a pretty uh, uniquely engineered product that we use for um, uh, air removal. All right, so here's an example of some of the different uh, products that we offer. We go from a, the smallest size of three quarter uh, all the way up to 14 inch pipe size. I'm talking about the diameter of the pipe here now. Um, up to two inch with press fittings on it. So now this version here is available as a threaded connection. It's available as a sweat connection. And now it's also available as a press connection. So if you're, if you're you know, moving over to the press uh, type of connection system, we've got them already built into our 
our product, you don't have to add that on and worry about having the threaded connection there. It's gonna come out of the box ready to go. And here's an example again from two inch pipe size and larger. We go to this um, steel vessel. These are ANSI flanges here. Um, we give you a nice uh, three quarter inch full port ball valve there. So if you wanna flush any dirt and debris out of this, you've got an access port there. Um, rings here, so if you wanna hang it with some clevis hangers to mount it, that's what that's for. There's that valve that we just talked about for um, for power flushing and skimming that as we fill it or for your injection point. And this is probably a little bit better picture of uh, how we use the top half of the disc L, uh, the brass disc L and the, the welded steel vessels. I think about, uh, oh, I don't remember now for sure, maybe six inch and larger, we put it on legs like this. It's getting to be a pretty heavy product to be able to support on the piping. So it'll be on legs like this. <clears throat> you can see the purge point uh, at the bottom of that. And again, this looks pretty small up there just because this is a pretty good size uh, diameter vessel here in real life. So it looks like a midget one, but it is in fact the same, uh, the same top brass portion that we use on all of ours from three quarter all the way up to the 14 inch size. I wanna show you a little bit more what's going on inside of that. So again, we go up to the, uh, the two different sizes here. Oh, it's eight to 12 inch, sorry about that. That goes to the, uh, the floor mount version at uh, eight inch and larger. And then over here, we're showing um, a little bit of a cutaway of what I was just talking about. I wanted to show you the difference here. When we use this brass top on the uh, welded steel vessels, it has a longer linkage on the float so that that float can reach down into the, into the chamber a little bit longer. It does has the same thread, but if you do have to replace one of these, a rebuild kit someday, just know that there's two different part numbers on this. The one that goes in the, uh, the brass one that I showed you earlier is just gonna be a short vent like this. This one has a longer stainless steel uh, linkage on it to reach down in the vessel a little bit. All right. Now, another important uh, component in the hydronic system is the fill valve that you use because it's the fill valve or the rate that that fill valve can work at that's gonna help you uh, fill up and purge air out of the system to begin with. So on our small uh, autofill here, I say small by a half inch connection on this, this valve will fill at 5.2 gallons per minute. It's a fast fill valve all the time. There's no levers, there's no hoops, there's no rings, there's nothing you have to do to this valve, but open the flow to it and it's gonna fill at 5.2 gallons a minute to whatever pressure that you set on the dial up here. Um, and that's uh, assuming that you've got at least 30 pounds of pressure coming into it, you'll get that 5.2 GPM fill rate. This is a little shutoff knob on the bottom of it. Just know that's not for adjusting it, that is a shutoff. So, over here, we offer that with a, a different type of a testable backflow preventer, same fill valve. You can see we've got a gauge option on it now, so that, that's good. So you can uh, confirm the pressure that you set it at and also use it for troubleshooting. If you have a leak in the system, shut this off. If the gauge drops down, you got a leak somewhere, so figure it out, fix it. Then over here on the lower right, this is a, um, a three-quarter version of our fill valve. Uh, nice about that is that um, I think a little over nine gallon a minute flow rate on that. You can see we've got the gauge on it. This is a version with the press connection on it. So uh, press connection, threaded connection, sweat connection on uh, all these different versions here. The, let's see what else. Oh, I was gonna talk a little bit about a purge card, I think on the next slide. So this, the, the key to this here is that if you can fill your system at a good flow, you're gonna have a much better shot of shoving those big air bubbles out the very first day you fill the system. If you've got a valve that's only filling a couple gallons a minute, number one, it's gonna take you a long time to fill your system, but you're gonna have a hard time getting enough flow through that, let's say radiant tubing or something to be able to evacuate your air out of the system. So. Uh, that's what we like about our fast fill uh, valves is that it, it helps you with your air removal. So not an air product specifically, but it certainly aids the removal of it. Now, this is another product that we offer. This is a fill and purge cart, and this would be used on a system if you wanted to put glycol in it. If you wanted to put a cleaner and run it through, you could actually use this pump as a pump to run the cleaner through for a day or something like that. Uh, it's got a little half horsepower pump, a little, it pumps about 12, 15 gallons a minute, depending on the, uh, the pressure that you're pumping out of it. So you can get a pretty good flow through this. And this is how we suggest connecting this into the system. There's valves that you can buy off the shelf that look like this. You've got two hose connections with an isolation valve in the center of it. Put that in your piping circuit somewhere. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pump out of this tank. I'm gonna pump into the system here. I'm gonna go around through my circuit, through my loop. I'm gonna come back. And now I'm gonna purge 
right out of the same valve on this uh, port to the right here. And what's nice about this, if you have one of the Cleffy purge carts and you use a valve like this, now I'm going to fill and purge from one point in the room. And I'm going to take and I'm going to purge right just barely into the top of this tank. And now any dirt and debris that comes out, number one, I'll see it. The air that comes out, I'm going to keep it in the tank and just let it vent out this little vent on this cap right here. So I'm getting my air out of my system instead of recirculating around and around again, which you would do with a closed loop system, uh, just waiting for the air purge to do its job. So we saw a lot of these as a pretty uh, popular component out there. Over here on the right, I'm going to show you two different ways if you don't want to buy one of these ready-made valves and maybe you've got some uh, T's and fittings on your truck, you can build your own. Really, all you need is a ball valve and that circuit and then two uh, uh, boiler drains or some kind of a cock with a uh, hose connection on it so you could build it that way. You could use a check valve in there. I'm not a big fan of brass check valves because they can make some noise issues down the road, but that would be another way that you could assure that the flow is going to go around the loop in one direction. So there's just a couple little uh, hints or tips for you to uh, to use a connection to a system for purging. I call this power purging just because we're using the horsepower here, the half horsepower, to um, move the fluid through there at a higher flow rate to do a quicker and a better job of getting our initial air removed out of the system. These we originally built when we were doing a lot of solar work because we needed to be able to pump the glycol into the, uh, into the collectors in the system. But uh, we're selling more of them now than we did in the solar days. People have keyed into this being a product good for flushing and cleaning systems out as well as, like I say, adding chemicals or just uh, getting a fast fill on a big, uh, maybe you've got a couple 10,000 feet of radiant tubing out there that you want to fill up quickly. This is certainly the, uh, the tool for that. Combination products. So let's take it one step further. Say, okay, we know we need to put an air vent. We've been talking about the importance of getting the air out. We've talked about the importance of why we want an air scrubber or an air uh, purger. What about if we make another function in this device and we do a dirt removal component in here? So now we've got air removal, we've got dirt removal, we've got a little drain here that we can flush it out. So now this becomes a three-in-one device. And the fact that if we put a magnetic band on it, which I should have put a picture in there. This one here has got a little magnetic band. So there's my air removal component. Here's my dirt removal component. And there's my magnetic particle removal component. So this does um, three jobs in one, uh, larger sizes. On the larger sizes, the magnetic rods go in the bottom like this. We put a brass drywall in there, and then we put a stack of powerful magnets in there. So as any tiny little metal particles that might be coming through from a non-barrier tubing system, for example, some iron uh, magnetite uh, byproducts of that corrosion, uh, we're going to grab them right here, pull the rod out at some point, put a valve under it and flush it. So there's my air removal, my dirt removal, magnetic removal, uh, three-in-one devices, all the way up to 14-inch uh, pipe size on these combination air, dirt, magnetic uh, components. Or let's give you one more function while we're at it. Here's a true four-in-one device, probably the only one on the market right now that is an air separation component. It's got the dirt separation component down here. It's got the magnetic separation component. And there's your closely placed T's for your primary secondary. In fact, I'm giving you a primary loop over here, maybe your boiler, your chiller, whatever you might have for your, your heat uh, source here. And over here is my distribution side. Take this thing out of the box. Fasten it on the wall, fasten your piping, make your connection to your boiler over here, connection to your distribution here, build flow of fluid, turn it on, and away you go. You've got all your air coming out, you've got all your dirt coming out, you've got any small particles that might develop over time coming out on the uh, magnetic function. And I think up to six inch pipe size, it comes with an insulation shell. This is, a, I think, a three piece. So you've got this, uh, this is actually hinged on the back that does the barrel. And then these caps just slide over the top and bottom, so you've got um, got it insulated, so you don't have a heat loss in the uh, in the piping from all that metal surface area. And then on the larger sizes, the the uh, separators, the four four and one separators. Obviously, we're going to go to a um, again a base mounted or leg mounted version here when we get up in the larger sizes. So we do go up to 14 inch pipe size on these also. So there's our four and one, or we call them SEP four, is the official name in our catalog for these. Uh, devices that do everything you need in the system. One more concept I want to show you because I know there's some of these systems still out there. These are systems that were pretty popular maybe, I don't know, back in the 50s or 60s. And what this system is, this is called an air management system as far as the hydronic side of it. So basically what we have in this system is we have just a plain steel tank, usually up in the joist right above the boiler, and there's no 
bladder, there's no diaphragm, there's no physical separation between the water that's in this tank and the air that's in this tank. So as this boiler warms up and the fluid expands, uh, this is a little fitting that B&G and some other people made that went into that tank and it would divert the air up into the top portion, you can see a little dip tube there, of this uh, compression tank. So we need to maintain that air bubble. That's why we're calling this an air management because that's my expansion space. If some reason somehow this air bubble uh, was depleted or pulled out of there, when the boiler heats up, it's going to expand and now you're going to pop your relief valve. So the mistake that happens with these old systems is somebody not understanding the concept of maintaining the air in there and any air that we pull out of this boiler I need to put up into this tank and they'll come and they'll say, you know what, I'm going to put a nice air purger right here on your system to make sure that we get all the air bubbles so you don't hear any noise or gurgling going on in your radiators. And what can happen over a period of time is this air that's in here gets reabsorbed into the water when the system cools off and now you start venting it out, venting it out, your fill valve kicks on and keeps fitting, fit, feeding water in, feeding water in, and you lose your air bubble in here and now the relief valve is going to pop. So um, if you see a system like this, either leave this fitting in there. Uh, if you're going to put an air vent on here, there's one thing that you can do is you can take the top of that air vent and just run it up so that that air that you're eliminating right here with your purger goes back and stays into the tank. All the systems that we've looked at so far, are what we call air removal, if I don't have a tank like this and I replace this with a bladder or a diaphragm type of tank, now I can put an air purger and get rid of all the air because my air is captive in my expansion tank by using a diaphragm, a bladder, a bag type of tank. So just understand the difference between an air removal and an air management system. I think I got a better picture of how you can do that. So <clears throat> that little cap I showed you a little bit earlier that transitions that thread into an NPT and now you could just take a little piece of 3 h copper tubing or something off of the air vent that you're going to stick into the piping here and take it right back into this uh, compression tank. So your your any air that you're removing from your piping, you're going to keep into the in the expansion tank there. All right, uh, a couple little glamour shots that we thought we'd throw in. Thanks for uh, people sending in pictures like this. We like to see your work. We like to see what you're doing and how you're using our product out there. So uh, just some classic uh, installations with one of our disc layers right there in the piping, uh, probably a boiler sitting above this. Another option here, and maybe it wasn't available when this was put in there, but this vertical version that we make now could go right in the piping here and you could catch the air before it even gets into the secondary loop down here. So that would be another option. And this one, by the way, with the rotating collar, it could be used in this uh, horizontal piping here or in this uh, profile that we show here with the vertically, you could just you know put it right into the... Uh, in the piping coming out of the boiler. That would be the hotter point in the system too, by the way, because now we're coming directly out of the boiler, which I think is on this pipe here, through our air separator before we get into our, our secondary distribution loop. And over here, this is a good example of uh, one of the insulation shells. Uh, most of our products in the catalog now, you can buy this optional uh, insulation three-piece shell. Again, just kind of cleans it up a little bit, or if you've got the, you know this in a little mechanic room where you kind of want to limit the heat loss, uh, from the components and from the piping, uh, we make that little insulation shell as a an optional component. And let's see what else we've got here. And another glamour shot. This is an example of a um, a system where he's put an air separator in here, and he's got a dirt separator here. Actually, a dirt mag is what this is. It's got the magnetic function. This is a, a an example where you could use a, one of those three-in-one devices. This could have been a a combination air, dirt, and magnetic separator in one component would have saved two separate components. But uh, thumbs up to uh, Jose for putting this in this way. I appreciate that he realizes the importance of using the, the magnetic separation in the system and uh, having a good air purger in there also. What else in this? Oh, and up here too on the other circles, there are some of our uh, flow type auto air vents on there. If this is a cleffy manifold, we do ship them out with these auto air vents. And these auto air vents do have that little hydroscopic cap that we talked about on the top of them also. So you've got your air vent, you've got your air purger, you've got your air vents at your high points. You can see in this room, that's the high point. And um, uh, the little hydroscopic cap also. So that's uh, that shows all the technology pretty much in one picture and a nicely put together system, I might add. Uh, just another example of one of our uh, bigger uh, uh, ANSI flange versions on this. Uh, I forget what the exact application was here up in uh, Canada on this system here with some big pumps and the big, uh, looks like a uh, maybe a four inch size uh, 
air separator there. All right, a little bit about the domestic water. Right now, I think we're the only company that actually offers a low lead auto air vent on the market. So this might be unique in the industry right now. Uh, one size, one connection size down here. This is a uh, half inch NPT thread on it, low lead vent. And then you notice it also has our little hydroscopic cap on the top for your second protection level. So this is a vent that's getting a lot more attention. Um, as we put in uh, maybe a storage type of water heater, we want to make sure that we've got all the air out of this when we fill it up or when new water comes into this. That would be an excellent spot to put up in the you know, low lead if this is domestic water. Obviously, it has to be a low lead product. Also, that ball valve needs to be low lead, by the way. So this is a very common application. This gets used a lot of times in uh, uh, water treatment equipment. Uh, if you have an equipment that's like pumping air into it for an iron removal or a sulfur removal system, you'll see there's an air vent on that system. That needs to be a low lead uh, component because that is touching the uh, domestic or the potable water in that system. And here's another example where we like to see these used. And a lot of times engineers, you'll see on their drawings, whenever they have risers going through a building like that, they want to make sure that there's no air trapped up in that, even on a domestic water system. So there's an example where a couple of, uh, of our plumb vents would be put on the top of the risers. And you might have a hotel or a big commercial building where you've got multiple risers going up through the building off of maybe a central piping line down here and you've got risers going up through the floors. Every one of those should have uh, air removal, either manual or an automatic uh, vent like this on it. And so now with the plumb vent, we can help you with that on both uh, potable domestic water systems as well as um, the hydronic systems, and this is rated for hot water, by the way. So if this is obviously a hot water heater, it can handle the temperature in both these systems, or it could be used on a, um, like I said, a water filtration as just cold water coming into the building. So um, <clears throat> other applications that we're seeing for this is uh, if you have a uh, an additional storage tank, maybe you have to add a tank here that you want to have uh, double your uh, dump load capacity, and you might have just a blank storage tank here, maybe a circulation pump between them. Uh, certainly do want to have an air vent on the top of that tank because as you fill this with incoming water that has some air in it, we would like to get the air out here. Another place, uh, I guess we kind of show it here on a domestic water recirculation, knowing that this is both an open and closed loop on this, you know, it's closed when there's no faucets being opened, the water's just going around from the, uh, the furthest fixture back down through the tank and recirculating through there. And obviously when somebody opens a tap, it becomes an, uh, an open system. Well, every time you open it, every time a faucet's open, more fresh water comes in, more air comes in along with that water. So I would like to see that both the tankless uh, heater, maybe there's one built into this, has an air removal device there, but also to make sure that that pump doesn't get air locked. That would be a, an excellent application for one of the, um, the low lead air vents on a uh, domestic water recirculation loop like that. Uh, what else can I tell you here? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it, what we do. Uh, like I said earlier, issue number 21 and 22 were on um, domestic water topics, some of our mixing valves, some of our um, our new uh, uh, balancing valves. Uh, we talked about in those two issues, and that's a little bit more information. We are getting into more plumbing products, if you notice in our catalog, so you'll see more and more uh, plumbing-specific products on our webinars coming up, as well as our hydronics coming up, and also uh, uh, on the shelves, hopefully, you'll see that product. So. Let me see what else we have here. Ah, it's the end. There's our tech support team up in Milwaukee. Um, if you need help with anything, you know, with one of our products, with an application, if you need some sizing information, uh, there's a team that can help you. We do answer the phone when you call up there. Uh, Naomi will have a pleasant voice to help you get to, through to the person that you need to talk to. Now, occasionally, every line in the building is busy, so you might get a message then, but we try and... Uh, personally answer and address your calls and get you to the person you need. You can get right to our, our fearless leader, Mark Olson. If you ask for him and he's in the building, he'll talk to you. So don't be afraid to uh, to reach out to us for whatever we can help you with. And uh, these guys can communicate via email. They can communicate with a FaceTime if you've got a phone that you can do that. They can uh, certainly email or talk to you on the phone. So we're here to help however we can. We all do tech support. If I'm on a job site and somebody needs help, I'd be glad to, uh, to help you if I'm out doing training. Uh, we're all in it for uh, to help you connect with us. Yeah, we try and maintain a presence on all these different platforms out there. I spend a lot of time online when I'm home under these conditions that we're under right now. I spend a lot of time on the uh, a lot of different chat rooms, Facebook rooms, Instagram, and stuff like that. So if you uh, 
if you want to reach out to us and chat with us there, share your pictures. We love seeing pictures. So um, uh, there's how you can get to us. And thank you.